point of this screencast is to give you a recap of what we covered in lecture two. Um, so we're just going to not going to go into some quite as much detail as we did in the <clears throat> actual lecture, but just going to recap and go over some of the theories um, again uh, for those of you that might have missed anything during the actual lecture. In this lecture, we talked about um, primarily let's continuing as we did in lecture one to look at brands from the perspective of the consumer. So to do this effectively, we started to think about um, some of the key kind of concepts in customer psychology um, that, were co that are covered in relation to when we think about brands. So in this screencast, we're going to be thinking about um, self-concepts and identity. Um, so why is it important in terms of branding? Um, what we call symbolic com consumption. Um, so the idea that we consume um brands products for their symbolic rather than their functional um purposes uh, and then we're going to think about what the implications are so from an organizational perspective what does all this mean why is it important um why do we need to understand it we talked about mcdonald's um so the idea that that plays on learning theory and is a kind of stimulus and response um technique so we use the mcdonald's or mcdonald's use their logo to stimulate um, a response in you we remember we talked about pavlov's dogs um, and the kind of um <clears throat> response something like the mcdonald's brand stimulates in its consumers and how they've managed to do that okay so we started off some of the theory by thinking about how brands relate to the self specifically Belk's theory, so this is Russell Belk, um, his uh, research is published in the G Journal of Consumer Research um, and his idea was around possessions and the extended self. There's a link to this in the Blackboard site under learning materials. So Belk's theory is that we extend who we are um, through the things that we own um, and this is not something new as we can see from William James's um, quote, so a man's self is a sum total of all he can call his. So Belt's idea is that the self is made up of um, all the things that we own and that those things will, uh, will reflect who we think we are. So if we have an idea of what we would call our self-concept, then essentially we would only buy or consume products and services that are consistent with and congruent with that self-concept. Now, Belt didn't specifically talk about brands because his research was published like nearly what, over 25 years ago bit longer um so he didn't specifically talk about brands um but he did talk about consumption activities so he did talk about possessions and, and buying things and only buying things that were really consistent with who we are um so we can talk we we can apply this to the idea of brands that essentially we will only buy brands that we think reflect either our actual self which is who we think we are or our desired um, or ought self. Um, and, and often authors talk about us completing ourselves with these brands. So sometimes we use them to populate gaps that we might have in, or perceived gaps we might have between the actual and the desired self. So there's a, a, there might be a little bit of a gap between who we think we are and where, who we think we want to be. Uh, and we might try and reach that desired self through the consumption of, of specific brands that we think reflect the attributes that we are desiring. Okay, So if we want to be considered to have higher social status, if we want to be seen as more fun or more edgy or more sporty, whatever it might be, we will consume brands that are consistent with that um, personality attribute um, to try and, and, and show that we have that attribute ourselves. This comes back to some really kind of fundamental theory on the self-concept and identity. So if we start with the self-concept, so the self-concept is pretty much um, all the kind of um, the set of beliefs that you hold about yourself. So it's your your idea, your concept of who you think you are. OK, um, so you might, you know, you might if I asked you, who, you know, who do you think you are? You might talk about roles that you have. You might talk about your personality type. It's all those beliefs that you hold about. Here we can see we've got Belt's extended self that we just talked about on the last slide. 
Um, now, where we move into identity, which is more of our outward projection. Um, so this is kind of us sort of projecting um, who we think we are to others. Um, and we th this sort of broaches into Goffman's area of research, um, which is presentation of self. Now, Goffman's argument was not only do we present ourselves to others, but we manage that process. So we think really carefully about the way we want others to see us and we will behave um, or, you know, manage the impressions those people form um, through our behaviour and our actions. Um, now, important point here is that that's actually reinforcing of the self-concept. So, for example, if we consider ourselves to be confident um, and we present ourselves in a way that's confident to others, that reinforces the idea that we are a confident person. And then equally, we've got this idea of the desired self, which is the, the thing that I talked about on the last slide um, around us having these aspirations that we're not completely um, complete in terms of who we think we are. So there are still um, aspects of us that we might like to develop or change. Um, and so we have this kind of actual self and then desired self. Um, sometimes it's called... Um, aspirational self or ought um, self okay so these are kind of I've just really brushed over the surface of these are really important concepts for us to understand if we're saying that part of the reason we buy the brands we buy is because it's influenced by our self-concept identity and the impressions that we want to make then understanding the underpinning um, foundations of theory here is really important Okay, so the, the idea of the self, there's obviously many different um, theories around the nature of the self, and we're not going to go into those in a lot of detail in this module, um, because we're primarily concerned with why we consume things, and in particular why we consume brands, rather than um, the nature of the self. However, um, in terms of consumer research, inherently we see the self as being um, born out of social interaction, um, and understanding who we are by how we interact um, with others. That means that we see the self as, as changeable rather than fixed. So some, so some psychologists would see the, um, the self as a, a kind of a nature argument that we are born who we are and we stay that way pretty much all the way through our lives. Because consumer researchers think we use brands to construct ourselves inevitably, the self is seen as malleable and something that can change and it's not a fixed entity and, and it might change in different contexts but it certainly changes through social interaction and much of the theory that we have down the left here um, is born out of the notion that everything that motivates us in life is, is around smooth social interactions so I'm conscious of myself because I want to have effective and smooth social interactions and that might be because I want to be accepted by my peers and have a sense of belonging um, it might just be that I want to make certain specific impressions on other people and this all comes back to the idea of um, Cooley's work which was as you can see is pretty old um, but Cooley's idea was his, his research um, made the argument that we were able to or we are able to take the position of others so we can imagine how other people see us and we use that information to influence the way that we behave and, and Mead was a, a another um, right seminal writer in this area, uh, area and he talks about me and I so that we have this kind of internal um, self where we, you know where we consider who we are but equally we have an external self too um, and as I mentioned on the last slide, that builds into Goffman's work, um, which Goffman's work was around dramaturgy. And what he saw is, is that through, through participant observation, so he um, did his research at a hotel where he stayed and he observed all the interactions and the way that people behaved. And he proposed that actually we really consider and manage the way that we interact with others and we have a front stage self and a backstage self and our front stage self is an act so we are actors and we play out roles um, and we really carefully think about the way others are perceiving with us and sometimes some of the criticisms of his work is that it's quite cynical and 
suggest that sometimes we aren't true to ourselves and we play out um you know an act that that isn't who we really are but is how we think others um will be influenced and, and because we want to positively influence them we act in the way that we think we should to get them to form positive impressions of us the key argument here is that it's all born out of social interaction and if you think about um some of the reasons you might buy brands are related to social interactions and enabling smooth social interactions and effective successful social interactions so building on that last point we think about this idea of shared meaning so you see this chap over here has got a brand on um and essentially through this shared meaning of the brand he knows that somebody else looking at him because of Cooley's theory thinks he looks cool and therefore that then makes him feel cool. OK, so this, this has to be the shared meaning, though. Obviously, if we don't understand the symbolic nature of the brand um, and other people won't form those impressions of us, it's really important that the brand has some meaning attached to it. Now, where that meaning derives from is is subject to kind of quite a bit of debate in the um in the consumer research literature so Elliot would argue that it comes from advertising so advertisers um present us with that meaning and, and we translate it and it, it becomes meaningful to us and others um others might argue that it derives from the consumer because you can probably think of at least a few brands where they take on meaning that's not what the brand wants it to have. So Burberry, for example, you know, that's not come from the brand itself, but it's been developed by a kind of subculture of a brand community. So um, there's no kind of absolute definitive um, theory here in terms of where meaning comes from, but it's probably a bit of a negotiation between um, company brand-based communications and individual experiences. And that all becomes quite sort of malleable into a, an idea around in, around the brand. So symbolism. So this is the idea that um, the brand symbolise something. So, um, you know, you can look at these two characters on the slide here and they will mean something to you just because of what they're wearing, how they're dressed. And Levy argues that this is a really inherent part of our human express expression so you know to enable us to express ourselves and convey our identity we like to consume and engage with symbols and obviously from a branding perspective that's really important so we go back to the meaning we think about what the brand might symbolize and, and what it might say to consumers about themselves and about others and um, that becomes a really important of, of part of brand theory So that leads us into symbolic consumption. So this is the idea that um, we, we start to think about the fact that we're now consuming brands, not just for their functional properties, um, but for their symbolic properties. So we're not necessarily buying a pair of Nike trainers because they're comfortable or they, they fit well or they keep our feet dry or whatever it could, could be on a functional level but it's down to our you know our symbolic reasons but because because of what they say about us to others or what they say about um us to ourselves so that's what's important here it's consumption because of the symbol um and and the brand not because of anything that the product does for us but what that brand means to us and what we know it might mean to others again think about that enabling of the um, smooth social interaction you know maybe if I'm wearing those Nike trainers I'm going to fit in a bit better I'm going to get social acceptance it might boost my self-esteem um, so it's all those kind of um, symbolic features that we're now interested in rather than just thinking about the functional aspects of the product this leads us into the idea of um, materialism so <laughs> the idea that um, we we place importance on our possessions. So going back to Bell, he defines materialism as the importance we, we attach to our worldly possessions. So how important are possessions to us and um, how much importance do we place on them? Are we not that concerned really with owning lots and lots of stuff? Or is this something that's really important to us and therefore we need to have resources to enable us to fulfil those 
um, wants, needs and aspirations. Um, materialism can be quite a concerning concept because, um, you know, in some ways it can be problematic. And often what we find, and those of you that read the journal articles will know, that low income consumers are particularly associated with being more materialistic than higher income consumers. So it's kind of like the less um, scope you have in life for other kinds of purpose, like from your job or um, whatever it might be, your career, then the more important you, um, you actually attach to owning material items, which if you don't have the resources to, um, to then purchase and own those material items, that can become a little bit of a um, vicious cycle. If you haven't already had a look at those articles that we used in um, this week's um, seminar, so seminar two, then please do have a look at them because they are really quite interesting. And, and uh, you know, some of them are long; you don't have to read all of it, all of it. But please do engage with them because I think you will find them interesting and they're really useful pieces of literature for both the coursework and the um, exam. So we talked a little bit earlier about this idea of symbolic self-completion. So this is where we might have perceived gaps between our actual um, and desired self. And we seek to populate those gaps with consumption. So we buy things, we buy brands to make us feel better about ourselves um, and, and, to, and to fill the gaps that we think we have. And you'll see here in the, in the um, going into this kind of like, filter, I'm not sure what it is, um, but you'll see a number of different self-related concepts here. So, you know, brands allow us to express ourselves and not convey our identity. They can give us a level of self-efficacy, so this self-belief. Um, and I'll put a link on the Blackboard site to an article on performance brands, which is really interesting. It's a recent piece of research, it's been published in the Journal, Journal of Consumer Research, and it talks about how um, actually wearing and owning brands in a performance context, so performance sport or academia, can actually improve um, our performance. It, it not only makes us believe in ourselves, but it actually has an impact on the outcome. So we do actually perform better because we're wearing that brand. Self-esteem as well. So um, brands are associated with self-esteem. And Isaacson and Rope write quite a lot about this and how um, sometimes, you know, low income consumers tend to be lower in self-esteem and equally um, a little bit more materialistic. So it's kind of like this perfect storm in, in terms of um, causing sort of concerns around consumption. Self-enhancement. So that plays right into this idea of um, completion and, and reaching your ideal or your desired self. OK, so you might think that through brands you can make yourself at least appear to be a better person in some way or achieve some of your personality attributes that you're trying to reach and self-verification so verification being you know yeah i'm that kind of person um and, and i fit in and i own that brand and and um, it really verifies um my group belonging so so brands can symbolically self-complete us in many different ways it's not just one particular type of self that um that it appeals to but lots of different aspects of the self okay so we've talked a lot about what brands mean from a consumer perspective so let's think about from an organizational perspective why is this important why might brands need to pay attention to and think about how they make um, self brand uh, connections so self brand connections are these um, connections we make with brands that are really quite powerful now they're powerful number one because they mean that we derive powerful brand attitudes so if we make a connection with a brand as a consumer we tend to be much more loyal so what do those self brand powerful self brand connections give us from an organizational perspective so because we are so loyal um, it means that we have a greater degree of forgiveness so if something goes wrong we're more likely to forgive the brand because we have that strong and powerful brand connection with them. We have a relationship and we um, and we like the brand. We're a, we feel quite, you know, we've got a degree of affection for the brand. So we do forgive mistakes. We're less likely to switch because we're loyal. So we like that brand. We know what, you know, we know what we get. It reflects who we think we are. 
um, and, and therefore there's less switching. So because of that, it then gives us this kind of quite powerful, enduring competitive advantage that can be really difficult to replicate. So it's that sustainable competitive advantage again and why it is so important. Um, brands can have powerful links to nostalgia. So self-brand connections can, can really um, amplify um, nostalgic links too. So if there's something that you consumed as a child, um, that connection can be really quite powerful. Um, they become part of our who we are um, and our story. Um, and, and because of that, it, we're hard to divorce from that brand. You know, we're really very powerfully connected to it. Um, Equally, you know, it, this is potentially brands. If, when we read the articles, we think, you know, it, ethically, is there a problem with brands and some of the stuff we're talking about? But there is this possibility of self belief and, and making us feel better about ourselves, which can be really positive in terms of brands. And that's certainly a vibe that comes across from the Guy, Garvey um, performance brand article is that, you know, this here, here's brands sort of doing good rather than encouraging us to be materialistic or spend more money. And, and consume brands just because of their symbolic properties. It's more about, um, you know, actually these brands are helping us perform tasks more successfully and, and doing good. However, so despite the fact that we're talking about brands being good and positive things and, you know, um, can, can sort of bring around satisfaction for consumers, there are some concerning ethical issues so we talked about materialism earlier and materialism can be problematic. Um, Belt's done a piece of research called the, the Trait Aspects of Materialism in there. He actually tries to research and explore whether materialism is a good or bad thing. Um, and he comes to the conclusion that actually it fosters some quite negative traits in consumers. Um, the buzz that we get from buying stuff tends to be fairly short lived. So, you know, if we're thinking, thinking about populating our self-esteem, that's not something where we buy a brand, our self-esteem rises and it stays there. It has to, we have to continually consume to keep that self-esteem at, at the kind of sustainable level where we want it. That means our self-esteem is kind of becoming commodified in the sense that brands are buying and selling our self-esteem. Um, and, and that's really quite a concerning idea, particularly when it comes to more vulnerable consumers, um, such as teenagers. Um, we haven't touched on this a great deal, but there was, uh, a, you may remember that a few years ago, uh, there were the riots, 2011, we had riots here in the UK. Um, and subsequent to those riots, the government commissioned a white paper, and I've put a link to it on our Blackboard site. And there's a whole section on um, brands and the riots and what kind of influence brands had over um, had, had in, and, and what role they had in the riots. Um, and interestingly, you might say nothing, you know, this wasn't anything to do with, with brands specifically. But um, referring to some of the papers we've referred to and looked at, this, this talks about this idea of, um, you know, those low income consumers and actually one of the the statistics that came out of that white paper that is that more than half of the criminal um, activity that took took place during the riots were, was acquisitive in nature. So it was about acquiring stuff and primarily targeted at luxury brands. So a lot of the looting that went on was targeting at those brands that consumers are desiring to own. So it starts to beg a question as if we're telling consumers that they need to own these brands to feel good about themselves or to have high self-esteem. What happens when they can't afford to own them? Does that then lead them to doing, you know, behaving in a way they might have not behaved before? Um, and then, of course, we have this deepening gap of wealth where the poor, get, um, the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. And that is increasingly concerning if we think about what we've said about materialism um and and low income consumers and the kind of vicious cycle that they can get um caught in so just to finish up um i hope you sort of see the importance of the self in understanding brands from a consumer perspective it's really very important um that we understand why consumers are engaging so um you know so so rapidly and, and so powerfully with with different brands um Recognising that brands have symbolic meaning um, and that leads to symbolic consumption. 
um, and what symbolic consumption looks like and why it's important. Think about those self-brand connections and why they're important from an organisational perspective. Materialism is important here and it's something we just have to be a little bit mindful of. Um, and I think there's some really, there, there are clearly some important and useful implications for organisations in terms of developing and creating brands and developing the meaning that underpins the brand. But equally, it does present us with some kind of ethical questions around um, the issues that brands raise with us um, and, and, you know, as a society, how we might deal with them.